Fellowship Sharon. I know we are very pleased to have all of you here today. And we'd like to thank you for taking precious time off from work or uh, this class today. To join us this afternoon, I hope all of you will have an enjoyable uh, time this afternoon. So, Lee Kong Chan Research Fellowship started in 2005 and we are into the 10th year. The fellowship aims to facilitate the research and publishing about Singapore and Southeast Asian culture, economy and heritage. This will enrich the Asia-centric collections and sources of the Lee Kong Chan Reference Library at the National Library of Singapore. So, to, this afternoon, to kick off uh, the talk, we have Dr. Sandra Hart, who will be presenting on the historical background of the London Missionary Society and Mission Press in early colonial Singapore. Uh, all right, Dr. Hart is a University Associate of School of Communities, University of Tasmania. She's recently published a book on Chimes, titled The Site of the Convent of the Holy Infant Jesus in Singapore, and find history of a colonial convent and education. The part is. We'll leave the questions and answer to the end of the three talks, okay? Thank you very much. Uh, and thanks for coming along. Society, obviously established in London, uh, 1795. This was a time of sort of great evangelical Protestant revival in Britain. Um, they were a non-denominational, non-conformist or dissenting um, organisation, um, meaning that they were a mixture of denominations. Uh, they wanted to uh, run a simpler style of service and an emphasis on the scripture. Um, uh, rather than the traditional sort of church of England um, service and hierarchy. Their aim, as you can see, was to um, spread Christianity among heathen and other unimagined nations. Now, when we read that, I'm sure we all think, oh my goodness, you know, sounds very racist to us today, I think. Um, but for them, they uh, saw it within a religious context of um, um, nations that really hadn't heard what they regarded as the, the word of God, the gospel. Um, and so one of their um, uh, uh, ministers early on um, famously said, uh, you know, talking to them in London, he said, ye were once pagans yourselves, um, and servants of Jesus came from other lands. So ought you not to send messengers to the, to the nations which are in like conditions for yourself of old? So, so this idea that uh, you know, um, Christianity came into Britain, uh, they were pagans that they received the gospel and that they had a responsibility to go out and spread the gospel as they understood um, into other lands. So I think we need to kind of uh, think about that word even in that context that we're really using it in terms of, of uh, people who were, um, were not Christians who, who hadn't been exposed to uh, the Bible teaching. Um, that was a time when there was a lot of kind of uh, excitement. Um, Captain Cook had just uh, completed his voyages to the Pacific. Um, 
together and ideas and charity and morality and, and doing good works, you know, much more middle class society developing. Um, so we had some disposable income to uh, give to the poor. Um, and an aspiring working class that wanted to uh, uh, improve their situation. Um, not only practically, but also in terms of a lot of adult education, sort of uh, small classes being run about that time. And so they weren't the very first missionary society, they almost were. There was one form three years before um, the Baptist missionary society. But they, were, um, they were very early on in that period. Um, and because of this emphasis on uh, the scriptures, um, the translation of the Bible and other Christian material was seen to be central to their mission. Um, and for this, they need a printing press, which is why they, uh, as you will see, they became so significant in terms of early printing. Um, the first missionaries actually were sent to the Pacific, it's the Captain Cook connection, and it's a in particular in other parts of the Pacific, um, Africa, West Indies, um, but really China was where they wanted to be. That was the, the big prize, this idea of millions of people out there that haven't heard uh, uh, the Christian um, gospel, and this was the place to be to be able to uh, convert um, huge numbers of people. So they, they really wanted to be in China primarily. Um, they sent their first missionary to China in uh, 1807, uh, Robert Morrison. Um, but at that time, Europeans in China were, were very restricted um, in where they could be. Um, they were restricted to the Canton area uh, during the trading season, and then they had to uh, uh, retreat to Macau. Um, and uh, there were also sort of, uh, restrictions um, from the emperor in terms of teaching um, Chinese foreigners, and later um, in terms of um, uh, translating Christian material. So it was very restrictive for him. But nonetheless, he started work on uh, translating the Bible and compiling an English Chinese dictionary. And we'll hear a bit more about that later. By the time the second missionary was sent out to China, it became um, even more obvious that really China uh, wasn't going to open up in the way they hoped it would. It uh, really wasn't su uh, sustainable. Um, and they needed another base in the region to do this. While well, they waited for a later opportunity to get into China. Um, so uh, William Milne, the second missionary, he um, did a look around and they chose him like the place to set up the base. It had a significant Chinese population, um, obviously, um, and the idea was they could perfect their uh, skills in the language, they could interact with the Chinese community in particular in Malacca, um, and um, you know, this would be a bit of a stepping stone for what they hoped would be their ultimate um, uh, move into China when, when things freed up a bit. And they were eventually to uh, um, also then go into Penang, Singapore, and Java. And collectively, they called that whole mission the Ultra Ganges mission. So, this idea of beyond the Ganges, beyond India. Um, um, before I kind of move on to specifically what they did in uh, Singapore and Malacca, I just want to kind of have us think about what were some of the challenges for um, missionaries going out to this part of the world in, in, uh, in 1915, 1919, and so on. And I think we have to think about things like just the very practical difficulties of travel. Um, there was no Suez Canal then. Um, you know, it took weeks, months uh, to get out here. Um, health conditions on board ships were often quite poor. There's no illness. Um, as they travelled out. And then there were, the, of course, the practical difficulties of communication. So though some of them were studying other languages um, before they came, you know, we all know, I think, the difficulty of becoming fluent in, in another language. So there's some very practical um, things about learning languages, but also communication back to London. Um, because it could take like a, you know, maybe a year or two to, you know, if you sent a letter to London uh, to get a reply back. 
And we'll see that in some of the very early uh, missionaries, the first um, LMS missionary to come to uh, Singapore. In some of his letters, you know, as time went on, you get this, you know, I haven't heard from anyone in London for three years. You know, I'm getting really discouraged. You know, I'm doing my best out here. I'm a long way from home, and no one's answering my letters. You know, so it's some very practical um, issues in terms of travel and communication. I know Facebook and my Twitter and and everything else. It would be interesting to see that for the feed that they have been. Um, and also just getting used to different cultures. Um, they were very in Bahrain uh, and uh, Britain. Um, and then before they could print, they actually had to get the printing equipment out there. They could get presses and they had to um, get the, the old type that they were in letterpress or the stones or the in zoography. Um, and where do you get them from? You know, so when they got out here, they had to work that out. Um, go to go to the car company to get presses, maybe, or you know, uh, make. Uh, they made a lot of the uh, the metal types and so on, because you couldn't get them in, in the Chinese dialects or in Java or whatever. They, they physically had to make them themselves. And then, like all of us, and particularly if you're a long way from home, there are all those issues, I think, about personal likes and dislikes. So, uh, you know, there was a little bit of getting under each other's skin and wrapping together in the mission houses and uh, some, some personal kind of disputes. And particularly with LMS, a bit of disagreement about whether they should be focusing only on the Chinese community or whether they should also be ministering to the Malay community out here. Um, and who should be running the show, if you like. And just maintaining, uh, maintaining morale and kind of thing. You know, I think it was a bit of a hard slogan. Look, look at uh, particularly the early LMS missionaries. They were trying really hard, but really they weren't making a lot of headway in terms of conversions. You know, very, very few conversions, almost none, very early on. Um, and just, you know, if you think about it, that was us. You know, maintaining your morale and you're, you're working every day. Um, in that kind of environment, I think it was a real challenge. And then the very practical one of illness and death. Really, their records you know, are, are littered with deaths of children, deaths of wives, deaths of missionaries. Um, Mill's wife, uh, when they came out from China uh, to Malacca, she gave birth on board ship to, um, to um, premature twin boys without a doctor on board and they couldn't afford to have a servant with them. And so she gave birth on, sh uh, on board ship. Uh, she then, during the rest of the voyage, had to look after the uh, young babies plus her uh, existing child, husband. Um, so there were a lot of, they were susceptible to a lot of very various illnesses and actually many of them died um, at various times on the mission out here. It was quite a time. Uh, death rate. So, what did they do? Uh, well, Milne, as I say, set off from uh, China to come out to uh, Malacca. He actually arrived in Malacca in 1815, um, along with a um, Chinese printer, uh, Liang Alpha, who actually uh, went on later to convert to Christianity and become uh, a preacher back in China. Um, then shortly after, Claudius Henry Thompson arrived in Malacca uh, to focus on Malay, um, and he um, and the mission recruited Munshi uh, Abdullah, who I'm sure you've heard of, who was a uh, uh, tutor in Malay, um, and he uh, tutored uh, Thompson in Malay, and we'll hear more about them as we go along, because he had quite a long association with the LMS missionaries in uh, various ways. Um, they did establish some small schools. There were, you know, as, as we go along, there were a lot of small missionary schools, I think run by missionary wives, um, that pop up and, and uh, you know, disappear again after a year or two often. You know, uh, they're often in the uh, homes of missionaries. Um, but that was, uh, again, a, a real challenge for them, I think. Um, but 1820, you may have heard of the Anglo-Chinese College in Malacca, Robinson, uh, sorry, um, 
Morrison, who came from China, who was very keen on that and helped um, and establish the Anglo-Chinese College in uh, Malacca. Um, and they started printing quite early on. They were printing primarily translations of uh, um, various parts of the Bible or other Christian tracts in either um, Chinese, I'm using that word kind of generically because it's kind of the word they use in their reports, um, and in Malay. And some in Java, which is probably known as sort of Arabic sort of version of the language of language in Malay. Um, they did their best with translations. I should read Abdullah's um, biography. He talks quite a lot about Thompson in particular, who I think probably nearly drove him mad because Thompson was quite convinced that he could learn Malay very quickly. Malay was an easy language to learn. Um, and poor Abdullah was saying, hey, look, I'm trying to teach you Malay. Uh, your Malay is terrible, but you're insisting on writing it like that and printing it like that, and what will people think of me? You know, I think I'm a really bad teacher. Um, so there's a lot of sort of problems with translations very early on um, in, in the, the history there. The East India Company, the British East India Company, supported them a little bit. They gave them uh, 100 Spanish dollars a month early on, and they raised money from uh, um, locally. Um, but there was very much this idea of, you know, we're waiting to go to China, really. So there's a bit of an emphasis on translation into Chinese rather than Malay, and that caused a little bit of dissension. So I'm just going to run through briefly there. Uh, highlights in printing in Malacca before we move on to uh, Singapore. And 1815 to 21, so again very early on, uh, they actually printed the first um, Chinese uh, magazine where the Chinese monthly magazine. It was very evangelical, um, but it also uh, included sort of general knowledge, science, you know, um, and by the time it closed, they were printing about 2,000. They also, from 1817, uh, produced the first completely Western periodical that was in Chinese Korean. Um, and that again had reports of missionary work. Um, but as you can see there, it also included philosophy, literature, etc., of the Indo Chinese nations, drawn chiefly from the native languages. So there's a lot of kind of reprinting of, of classic um, Chinese texts and things like that. <coughs> And in 1823, they, they uh, printed Morrison's um, Chinese translation of the Bible, or the assisted him in that. Um, and that was the first in Southeast Asia and the second um, uh, printing uh, of the Bible in Chinese anyway. That uh, picture that you can see, uh, you can see that they, um, this is actually a uh, reproduction of the uh, Singapore um, Bible Society is, is doing at the moment. Um, um, Genesis is a particular photo. You can see that you know it wasn't an entire Bible as we would think of it. Um, they printed it often by chapters, and they, they um, on fairly sort of flimsy paper with, with cotton sort of thread through it uh, often. And um, you know, some some of their early works have survived, and some of them. Works of here in the library, which is, which is a, a, a great feat, really, to have been kind of over that once. So let's move on to Singapore, which is the area that we're really interested in. Um, but Malacca and the Singapore missions are quite connected, which is why I've spent a bit of time on that. Um, so, as I said, they came here uh, just a few months after uh, Raffles, um, October 1890, Sunday Milton arrived, Chinese um, and uh, Siamese language. Uh, then in 1822, we've got Thompson transferring over from uh, uh, Malacca with uh, a bit of to concentrate on Malay and Bookers uh, as well. Uh, Raffle was a part of the quite supportive of their work. Um, and in fact, um, because there was no printing press in the settlement, Raffle's really saw 
the LMS as a, as a way of, of getting um, a printing press uh, operating uh, in Singapore. And uh, they actually um, printed his very first proclamations um, in the first of January 1823. They were printed by the, the mission press, by the London Missionary Society with the fellows. Um, oh. They started some small schools. Um, but Raffles was particularly interested in this Anglo Chinese <coughs> college in Malacca. He had this idea in Singapore of setting up a Singapore institution. And he and Morrison um, had discussions and had sort of written agreements almost uh, to transfer the Anglo Chinese College from Malacca to become part of Singapore's um, the Singapore institution. Um, the whole Singapore institution kind of folded and it really sort of got going early on. Um, and so the college did the group, uh, as it turned out, of serving Malacca. And then there was quite a sort of messy period here um, when Milton went off to uh, Calcutta to try to buy some presses, hadn't heard from uh, London, um, they hadn't responded to his request or you know, send some money or send some printing presses. So he went off and he bought some presses in Calcutta with his own money. Um, and then came back, they were, he denied it, but it seemed that he was sort of bankrupted really. Um, and Raffles stepped in and, and said that um, you know, the Singapore institution will buy them. And so they bought them from him and uh, set them up in this sort of uh, very embryonic uh, Singapore institution, Milton Prince from there. Um, and Thompson stayed at the uh, mission house in the first class there and printed uh, this millennium with his works there. Uh, the mission house is actually where Raffles Hotel now stands, so it's very, it's very close to where we are now. They did some commercial printing. They wanted to raise money, raise funds, um, and so they printed government regulations, various other commercial works. Significantly, they uh, they were the printers for the very first newspaper in Singapore, the Singapore Chronicle, 1824 to 30. They didn't write it, they didn't own it, but they printed it. Um, you know, hence the significance to the printing press in, uh, in Singapore. And then we've got this other quite messy period. Uh, um, Milton uh, was, uh, I've said they discharged, uh, this delegation came out. Um, they thought he had all these sort of grandiose schemes for uh, the things he'd actually attended um, at one point. And his colleagues in Malacca actually thought he was insane. Um, so he, he was sort of uh, moved on. Um, which really left the mission here without a Chinese focus for, for a period of you know, 10 years or more. Um, and then uh, Thompson uh, also came uh, under the uh, microscope, another uh, LMS delegation visited the next year, um, and they really thought that he was uh, sort of doing his own thing in terms of printing and you know, uh, interested in uh, his own commercial and sort of enterprises and um, considered him destitute of missionary talent. Um, uh, so much so that there was almost a complete inactivity in his missionary duties, they said. Um, and at that stage, the LMS um, in London actually resolved to abandon Singapore uh, as a mission. Um, but they subsequently changed their mind with a single that decision and it did in fact continue on, but things were really not quite difficult in that period. Despite their view of, um, uh, in particular, of uh, Thompson and even Milton, you know, by 1830, uh, as you can see there, they were actually um, uh, distributing quite an amount of material on the small junks and, and boats in the harbour in particular. 1830, 60 diamonds, 200 testaments, 4,000 tracts, um, handed out, they handed them up free. So we don't really know how many could be read or how many were read. Um, and uh, 1830, same year, Thompson's Circle on the Mount uh, in the name was published. The library actually holds a copy of the uh, rare books collection. They were hopeful by handing out a lot of these on the Johnson Harbor, but some of them would make their way to China. 
was mainly about how the cops did credibility and the Malay um, uh, potential leadership that it was about. This might be a way to get some of their works into China. Um, and uh, 32, 33, Thompson published his code of, he didn't write the code, he had said the code of his maritime laws. Pretty impressive, I think, at the stage, you know, he learnt the lay, however well he might have spoken it, or written it, but he also learnt the same code for this language as well. Um, he now said that he could actually um, print and, and publish the code of um, Bogus Maritime Laws and also the um, English Malay Bogus Vocabulary. Like a little sort of fiction um, So he was doing something there when the Prime Minister, the delegation actually thought he was slacking off. Um, but it wasn't all well because he actually ended up leaving in 34 under a cloud. Um, there were sort of allegations that he was, I think I'm found it, that he was involved with some local women. Um, and he left, um, but he really claimed that the printing equipment that he was, uh, was being used by the Russian government to him, he belonged to the LMS, um, and the land. And, uh, um, so he actually went ahead and he sold it. Uh, to another missionary group, the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, uh, leaving the LMS really without a press. Um, so they were in trouble. Uh, the American Board ran the press until 1843. Uh, they did reprint some works in Chinese from another missionary uh, society, Blocks, um, How Thin the Latter, um, and also for some new, uh, more capable um, LMS uh, men who came out. Benjamin Kingsbury, who I'm going to talk a bit more about, did they join them in 1839. They did actually buy him in a press. So he was able to do some of his own printing in that period. And um, another missionary, Samuel Guy, who came across from the Latin in 1842. I um, just want to say a few words on Guy and his wife before we we'll move on a little bit. Um, he transferred from Penang in the Latin. Um, he is very significant in terms of pioneering the printing of uh, uh, Chinese characters by metallic types. Instead of using the kind of block printing, um, he actually, um, he kind of worked out of, of all of the, of the Chinese characters, one of the ones that are most going to be used in missionary literature. So that was a big sort of exercise in itself before he got, got going. And then he had to work out, you know, what is the best way to actually make these small you know, metal types with the Chinese characters on them. Um, and it's really very much a kind of a trial and error um, situation that he perfected over a number of years. Um, and, but he's now actually credited with being the first to actually create a Chinese font of useful um, metal types. His wife, Maria Dyer, um, some of you may be familiar with, we often don't hear about missionary wives, they're often quite absent from, uh, from history. Um, but uh, Maria, his wife, came with him in 1842 and she started a small school for Chinese girls um, in North Beach Road, which she calls. Um, another one of these very small uh, mission schools, often, as I said, you know, came and went quite quickly. Um, she left after Daya died. Um, a year or so after his death. Um, and uh, I think it was very possible the school would have just disappeared. In actual fact, it was taken over by the uh, Society for the Propagation of Female Education in the East. Um, and it survived and kind of morphed with other um, later sort of decorations of uh, the Christian missions into the St. Margaret School of the um, And uh, I think because of that, uh, you know, she's now in the Singapore Women's Hall of Fame um, for her contribution to girls' education in Singapore. We have her uh, mother and children from the convent, um, and uh, Maria Dyer, which you know, is a, a, a Protestant representative. I don't want to wipe her out of history, because as I say, missionary wives are often uh, not there. Um, but I think because it was perhaps more sort of good luck than anything, because she had the uh, 
Society for Female Education who could take over the school. I, I kind of think that in a sense we might think of her as saying that all of those unnamed, unrecognised missionary wives who have started school schools along the way um, and often toiled away without any real recognition. Things are starting to open up in China. Um, first Opium War, 1839 42, in the when um, British East India famously virtually forced um, China to trade in opium with it. Uh, and uh, um, their success in that meant that the Treaty of Nanking, um, Hong Kong was given to the British, and they opened up five ports to uh, British trade. So, you know, at last, if you like, um, it also opened up China to missionaries. So we actually see a bit of a movement from Singapore to China. Um, 1843, the American Board of Foreign Missions left Singapore. Um, they gave the press and the land back to the LMS. Um, the LMS also uh, waiting for China at this time. Um, eventually, uh, the last mission we left in 1846, and the mission was formally closed in 1847. If you like, having seen this area as a staging post to get to China, now the game was on and they could actually get there. And so their mission was formally closed. But one of their missionaries, Benjamin Keesbury, actually stayed on. He's a limited uh, initial assistant from LMS. Um, and he virtually continued on with the same work, as I said. So I'm kind of stretching that kind of time, if you like. Though he wasn't officially um, then with the LMS, he was continuing his uh, um, work on his being followed down at the time. So I'm going to kind of buzz through a little bit. Um, he preached in the Malay Missionary Chapel. He bought a plantation in River Valley Road, renaming it Mount Zion, with the full reference. Moved his presses and boarding school from the Bay Boys then. Um, he did a lot of work on improving lithographic printing to resemble handwritten Jawi, which is a major mission from the Bay Publishing. Um, and he produced a magazine, Chairman Matty, you can see the photograph you know, how, really how beautifully um, he perfected that. Those colours, if you see it now, in the Bay Books area, are so vibrant. Um, he printed a Dulles book, um, 1849, or was two books, including the famous uh, Hitting Out of Dollar. Um, first printed works he comfortably read by the Brit Malays. Um, <coughs> established a church jointly in Book of Timon. Died. Press was actually a lot commercially, so that was really the end of the mission press for he died. Why the context? What were these missionaries doing? Were they really part of uh, you know, uh, the oppression of the empire, or were they uh, early humanitarian aid organisations with their schools and their social services, or was it a bit of both? And I think we have come to kind of see it as not quite as black and white, it's been painted in the post in the past. There's only a bit of a debate about Abdullah, was he a sort of a pawn of the, the missionaries, some mouthpiece of them? Um, And in Singapore, uh, I think we've seen that, you know, as I said, Raffles and the East India Company were happy to have them here as long as they didn't need to be in trade. So they could actually provide services if they didn't want to come. Um, but of course, they also buy their commercial printing and their printing for government were part of this helping to enforce colonial law in the years of um, modernity. So, um, were they kind of really, you know, culturally insensitive? They were certainly very vocal about, you know, what they saw as idols and Chinese temples and so on, superstitions. Um, but there was an attempt by Morrison and Norman in particular to be culturally sensitive, this kind of idea of printing with the Chinese classics and so on. Um, didn't make a lot of progress in the Malay communities, but they did record aspects of local practice that might have otherwise been lost. They were kind of tolerated, I think. It didn't make them a lot of headway with conversions. How much was actually read? They'd come across, you know, their works for sale, you know, or, or uh, being used to cover up fruit and, and gardens and all sorts of things. Um, but the Sultan of Johor and his brother attended Peaceful School. Um, 
so here they obviously uh, respected what his view was doing. We see some remainders today, not a great deal. Um, we see them there. Uh, it's in their printing, really. It's all this, uh, you know, being really the first printing person in Singapore. Um, and what they did, their books were used for many years. And uh, he's been sort of the graphic printing process in particular, had a spread in the hat on the Muslim world. Um, just want to end with this idea of imagined communities. Uh, the famous uh, book by uh, Benjamin um, Anderson, Benedict Anderson, uh, who kind of said, "Look, well, nations are social constructs, constructs are ideas that we have." Um, and how is it done? He really said, "Look, with the introduction of printing in the West, um, you get printed materials." Um, low-cost books, newspapers, people are reading the same kind of things and this helps them to kind of develop a sense of shared identity. And I suggest that perhaps, you know, without overstating the case, you know, the early printing of missionaries in Singapore and Malacca also led to some of the of sense of that very beginning of a shared sort of uh, regional identity. Um, don't think we should overestimate their impact. Um, but on the other hand, they're part of the rich history of Singapore and um, the spread of Christianity, pioneers of printing. Um, and thank you, and apologies for going out of time. It's fun to have you all Thank you, Dr. Mike. And next, we have uh, Mr. Jason Hain, who will share his findings on the validity of the set of oral tradition published in the 1952 Shoe Skin Malaya by Pua Chay No which claims that a group of Teochews from Siam or Siam were established in Singapore before the arrival of Stamp Rebels in 1890. Please welcome Jason. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank the Li Gong Chen Research Fellowship and the LP for this opportunity to share my findings on this uh, topic, which I personally find very interesting. The Teochew oral account of the 1819 founding of Singapore, what is this about? Uh, it's basically a set of oral traditions, claiming that a group of Teochews from Siam or Thailand were established in Singapore before Sir Stanford Raffles arrived in 1819. This was published in this book, Teochews in Malaya, from 1950, and its editor, Mr. Paul Ching Long was at the time a publisher and also a director with the Nihan Kong Si and Kyuchu Kui Kui Kwan. Now it may seem strange to some of us that you know, there's a claim that there are Kyuchus in Singapore before breakfast came. But it appears that this belief was quite widespread amongst the local Kyuchus for I found quite a number of publications by the Kyuchu communities at the time, 1940, 50s, stating the same thing. Just very quickly, what are the Teochews? The Teochews are the second largest group of Chinese in Singapore, numbering half a million. And they come from eastern Guangdong province in the Teochew, their own prefecture. And being a coastal people, the Teochews also have large overseas communities in Hong Kong, Ho Chi Minh City, Johor, Singapore, Guantiana, in Borneo, and particularly in Bangkok. Now before I speak further about the future oral account, let's just do a quick recap about what we've always been told about how Singapore was founded. I think we all know the story, right? Singapore was first a Malay village in 1819, and then we're now a global metropolis. Because of this man, the Stanford Raffles, who came on 28th January 1819, and with his genius and perception changed the destiny of Singapore. To a large extent, this storyline is framed by what Raffles wrote in his letters to England, calling Singapore my new colony, and uh, claiming that it was an insignificant fishing village with only about 200 people. And after he came, thousands followed, uh, mainly, uh, mainly being Chinese. Now the problem with this wonderful story is none of what he wrote was actually packed by other sources. For example, James Madison, an uh, open trader who stopped over in Singapore in May 1819, reported at the time that there were only upwards of 2,000 Chinese, far less than what Raffles was claiming. 
And one year later, William Farquhar, the first president of Singapore, wrote to the first reporting of census he conducted that found Singapore to have only 4,727 people, and including over 1,000 Chinese. In fact, subsequent census conducted by the British show that the population in Singapore only exceeded 10,000 at the end of 1823. And the Chinese only overtook the Malays as the largest community here in 1827. Now, Farquhar uh, first came to Singapore on 30th January, on 28th January, and after one day's discussion with the island's ruler, the Mango of the Raman, he came to a written agreement to set up a East India Company trading factory. And a week later, this was formalized in a treaty with the former Crown Prince of Johor, Hong Kulong. And the speed by which things happened shows that William uh, Raffles had a plan before he came, right? And in this book published by the NLB, Raffles and Hastings, we find a private exchange that Raffles had with the EIC Governor General on 8th January, just 10 days before Raffles left Penang for Singapore. They're reporting that he had information showing Singapore had 2,000 inhabitants whom he called new settlers. And later towards the end of the year, Raffles in another report to Lord Hastings told that when the British flag was hoisted, there were 53 Chinese. Now note that these two pieces of important information were not revealed at all to, in Raffles' letters to England. So this was to India. So he had one story to England saying that 200 people fishing village, and then to India, 2,000 people and a group of Chinese. And a week after Raffles got his treaty, he made a submitted an official report to India concerning how he got to Singapore. And here he gives a full-length description of the Chinese, calling them industrious and reporting that they were already established in their materials. Uh, further down, you see that he says that they were involved in tin smelting and cultivation. And then in the middle of the passage here, he, he also states, speaks about uh, expectations of trade with Siam and also promoting activities. So what is clear here is we're not talking about an insignificant fishing village. So what was the truth? Now to a Penang merchant, Raffles privately admitted that when he first arrived in Singapore, there were only 500 people, and uh, they were mainly from Malacca and Rio. Rio meaning Bintan Island. And this was independently verified by William Fakwa, who wrote separately that the Temenggong was established here before the 500 of his own followers. Captain John Crawford, who was another member of the expedition party, wrote in his diary. He confirmed his diary that there were a group of Chinese who encountered about upwards of 100 who offered their labor to the British. Now compare this figure with Raffles' number of 53. Raffles' figure was half of this, and it was so very specific, which is quite suspicious because unless he counted every one of them, so now I've counted 53 people. So could the future oral account be the story of this group of Chinese who have still today not been fully accounted for in our history? Let us look further. The future oral account was actually described over two passages in the Hua Long book. And the first begins by saying that before I first arrived, Singapore was a fishing village and there was a Malay Sultan residing in Siklakmeng, which is the colloquial Chinese name for Tolokanga. And then he says that originally there was a group of Teochews from Anyong, a county in Teochew, who came here and they were all took as Malays. But did this happen? He didn't stay. But he says that subsequently more Teochews were recruited from Siam and they live at this place called Swan Yate, which is where Wat Hai Chin Bio, the temple is. The temple is still today at, uh, by the mouth of Singapore River on Philip Street, behind UOB and OCBC building. And it states also that they are then first the leaders of this Teochew, uh, two persons from this village called Tang Khoi, Wan Hong Kim, who is supposedly the descendant of Dr. Huang Singh, another person. And the second person is Ning Hong Su. 
and these two men supposedly took what Hai Cheng Liu and they were the leaders of Niang Kung, which is the forerunner of Niang Kong Si. And it gives more information about the truth. And here at the bottom, it, it gives an important piece of info, saying that the two truths were originally set up in front of Fort Canning, in front of Fort Canning Hill, and they had a plantation there called Sun Hing. Now the second passage is basically the same, but it adds a, few, a bit more details. For example, saying that uh, the Kuchus not only occupied Fort Hatch in the area, but also Fort Key, and says that this second group of Kuchus were got along pretty well in the days, I'm at the first. And here there's a bit of conflicting information, identifying both Ben Kim and Hing Hong, Hing Hong Sun as the descendants of Dr. Kwan Singh. Whereas the first account says that only in Kim. So there was some there's some confusion here. And so on. So this book is available at 11th floor of the NLB. Right? So if you're interested, you can read it. So what can we observe here? Firstly, we can easily identify the Malay ruler mentioned to be the Mango of the Ramas. Because the Mango of Tumang told the British that he came in 1811 and he stayed by the Singapore River, which his residence is near where the Asian Civilization Museum now is. And until the British forced him to relocate to Tolo Blanca in 1823. And while the British sometimes called him Malay chief, he's actually a high ranking official, the chief minister of justice for the Johor something. He was the third highest ranking person there. And yes, help five them over the space of Singapore and land on both sides, meaning Batam and so Singapore and mainland Johor. And in another section of the Kuchu Malaya, Kwa Ching Long states that Wang Hai Chengdu land was actually granted by the Mangong. And here on this map, you can see that the temple is actually located directly opposite from the, the Mangong to palace and uh, where Red first landed. Now, although this book, which is Malaya, was published in the 1950s, there's no overt signs of Chinese nationalism or anti-colonial sentiment. You can see that there's no attempt to glorify the Chinese or denigrate the British. I think you might agree with me that it's fairly objective. And it was considered fairly credible. And it was, the same account was, was cited in subsequently a number of Chinese books and articles concerning the in Unfortunately, Kwa Ching Long didn't state who exactly were his informants, and he only described them as coming from oral tradition, which we know are, are passed down from, by word of mouth two generations, and so they are vulnerable to distortion and loss of detail. So before we can actually say that the future oral account fills a gap in our Singapore history, we need to, we need to assess its accuracy and totalness. So what I did in my research is first to seek to identify if the Tuchu settlers meant to describe were as a were the missing Chinese from our, that, that refers reported. And also examine some key revelations. Uh, particularly whether they did did they uh, set up this Fox Swan kind of thing and were they from Siam and the identities of their leaders. Now, to identify these two two settlers, although refers in many times tried to portray himself as the man responsible for bringing the Chinese to Singapore, never wrote again about the Chinese after what I've mentioned. Instead, when he came back in October 1822, for the third time, he left his secretary to write to Fakwa, asking to find out about the background of these Chinese. And from the replies of Fakwa, we find out that the Tamangon did before the British came, run gift to various Malays and Chinese to pay ground for a number of plantations. Uh, Papua himself observed this plantation to be around Siliki and uh, around St. Pearl's Hill, which you see on this 1835 map, with the arrow pointing. And uh, Papua added that uh, the Chinese were the Polo 
those of Captain China, who is a Chinese whom the British appointed to be the leaders of all the China in Singapore, all the Chinese in Singapore. And it was set up originally by on a plane by the Singapore River North Bank. Now in 1823, Raffles demanded that China captain remove a Chinese movable temple and light from Great Tree within a space with that he wanted to build a church. And from this Jackson plan of 1822, we see this location to be in front of Hill Street, that is right before Fort Canning Hill. So what we can see is basically is that there, the, there was a group of Chinese set up in front of, of Fort Canning Hill with, who were engaged in the Plantation plantation as the future oral account mentioned for the Tunin plantation. Unfortunately, Farquhar didn't exactly call, didn't directly call them identify as the two, but did give a clue, saying this the Captain China was the leader of the Canton Chinese, as opposed to the Amoy Chinese, who later had their own leader. Now Amoy, as you know, is the old name of Xiamen in southern Fujian. Uh, so obviously the Amoy Chinese were the Hongkins. And what we immediately think of the Canton Chinese as the Cantonese. Xianqin in 1844 wrote that Singapore at the time had about 10,000 Gambian planters. <coughs> and almost all of them were Teochew, and there were 400 Macau. So, what does this tell us? This tells us that the Gambian industry was controlled by the Teochew. And uh, the Cantonese at the time were called Macau from the port where they came from. So, how do we confirm that the Canton Chinese are the Teochew? Now, Yu Chan Poon was a co-founder of the Teochew Protocol. He, he, he reportedly said that the Teochew cultivators, a group of Teochew cultivators were established in Real or Bintan before Singapore, before Singapore was opened. And the Tufat El Nafis, which is the chronicles of the Johor Sultanate, tells us that Gambia cultivation was established, brought into Real in 1740, and Chinese from China were brought in as laborers. Now, uh, it didn't state exactly where this Chinese came from, but in the 1780s, after the Dutch occupied Real, after a war where they, the, the, the Portuguese and the Malays there all fled the island, the, Portuguese, the Dutch reported that two groups of Chinese, the Tang Canton girls and the Moyers, took over the plantation, and they each had their own captains, one in Sangarang and one in Tanjong Pina. And in a Chinese, a study on the Chinese in Real from 1976, we find that Sangaran was actually known, is actually known locally as Jopo, which means the Kuchu Bank, River Bank, or the Kuchu Town, and Tanjong Pina as Hokpo. So I think we can conclude with, with the tale of confidence that Canton Chinese refers to Canton girls, uh, which refers to the Kuchu. So the, the Chinese were first encountered were Teochew. Now, regarding Swan Kiang now Papua reported that where the Teochews originally occupied them, the Port of Canada was later taken over by the British for cantonment or military use. And then um, in June 1819, the Malays and British had an agreement stating requiring that all the Chinese to move over to the south bank of the Singapore River. And from this map, this is just a part of the map, the built map, which you can see on the 11th floor of the list library, uh, which was recently resurfaced and exhibited, shows the exact boundaries of this Chinese town and the get ground to cover Wat Kai Ching Bio and Boat Key. So what was this place called Suan Kya Teng, uh, top of the little hill? Now uh, I have an arrow on the map showing Below the Chinese town, there was actually a hill there. Now, according to Munshi Abdullah, who visited the place in mid-1819 before the Chinese moved in, he, he basically described the place to be a swamp. And true enough, the, the, the conditions were bad, so bad until, until 1822, only a few traders were living there. On the other hand, Munshi Abdullah said that the hill was a large rise of moderate elevation. 
So obviously the Chinese knew where to build their house, right? And from a Chinese partition letter in December 1832, it states that there were 130 houses. What was this letter about? Well, Raffles, after Raffles came back, he wanted to level this hill and then uh, build a new commercial square there, which is now the present Raffles place. And they used the soil to fill up to retain both key. And eventually he did it his way, which means that this hill was never shown, never found on any maps in Singapore until the big map was recently rediscovered. And the fact that the Teochew still talk about this sort of thing means this uh, shows the age of this oral tradition. Now, the Gamble Connections will tell us that the Teochew came immediately from well. So why did they uh, remember them coming from Siam instead? There are many early signs of signs of early Siamese connection to Singapore's development. Firstly, Raffles mentioned in his report from Gisette, February 1819 that uh, possible access of Singapore to to, ex, to trade for resources from Siam, which was surprising because the British had no official relations with the Siamese since 1687 because of a massacre of the uh, English community. And then, when the first trading ships came, when the monsoon started, Parker reported Siam to be of first importance. And later, by March, at the end of the trading season, there were about more than 20 Siamese junks here. This was a surprise to Farquhar because the British had done nothing to attract trade. Raffles had no permission to, to set up a settlement in Singapore in the first place, and so the EIC had no budget for him. And the instructions to William Parker was just keep a military post and do nothing else. On the other hand, Bangkok was reported by John Crawford, who was an ambassador, who was an envoy there in 1821, that Bank, or Siam was a hub for more than 200 Chinese trading towns linked to China and Southeast Asia. And Bangkok at the time was dominated by, the economy was dominated by the Teochews. Particularly after 1809, there was an influx of labor, uh, particularly in sugar cane cultivators and pepper cultivators. Chinese, the Teochews actually started moving into Siam in the 1730s, but only in large numbers after 1767, when the old city Ayutthaya was destroyed by the Burmese, and Thaksin, whose father was an immigrant from Al led an army to drive up the Burmese, and his army consisted largely of Teochew migrants living in Thailand. And subsequently, a large number of Teochew merchants were recruited by him to, to, uh, to represent him and to gain revenue for his kingdom. Particularly in the 1730s, 1770s, the Tufat El Nafi says that a large number of Chinese merchants from Siam were trading there. And the involvement of Teochews that you can see from a deity tablet of Ma Zhou, Ma Zhou, who was the goddess state of the Chinese seafarers, they were found in Sangara. And this connection was basically broken for the war uh, and revived later when Raja Jamfa, the, the Portuguese chief, seized power over the entire Johor continent. What happened was the old sultan had passed away and Ajahn Jafar prevented Tengku Long from becoming sultan and instead installed his younger brother as a puppet ruler. And coincidentally, in the same, very same year, a, a flood was donated to the Matu Temple in Sankara by a particular captain. And when the Dutch returned in 1818, they reported that the Chinese in were no longer under two captains, but one who was a Canton, a Canton Chinese. Now, what's the connection to Singapore? Remember, there's a chapter of Singh mentioned in the Teochew oral account. It was described as a forerunner of the junk trade. Now, from Chinese online articles that are found, chapter of Singh was the nickname of a person called Tam Ban Singh, who left for Siam and became a wealthy junk trader. And he owned 18 junks, so start with 18 punching. 
And he was a very important person. Uh, he was elected by a pharaoh of King Saksin the Tenton in 1775. And um, this will explain, his connections to the leaders of Kyoto I will explain the, how the, the Kyoto connection to, the assigned connection to Singapore. Now to verify the identities, Captain China, if the Kyoto Oral count is correct, one of them, Hong Kim or Hong Kong, had to be the Captain China. But Papua again doesn't reveal anything. So instead, I managed to identify a, a community in existing committee for Chang Khoi, which is 20 kilometers from Ampo. And all the people that have to tend to be have a common ancestor with Sen Heng. And apparently this place became prosperous after the chief maritime custom office of the Tiu Chu prefecture was formed here in 1730, in Ampo in 1730. Uh, there's a problem here because as we found out, Chapot Ban Singh's name was Tan Ban Singh, his surname was Tan, right? So we are talking about Heng and Tan. So how, where's the answer to this? It comes from another wooden park, again in Sangara, a second temple devoted to Shen Hing Sang Ki, donated in 1821 by a Capitan Tan Hing Kim. Now in Teochew, and only in Teochew, the surname this character is pronounced Wa Heng, and the middle character of Tang Heng Kim is also pronounced Heng. And on the other hand, a list of Chinese captains in real but from the Dutch shows so three persons, but none something like Tang Heng Kim. So we can conclude that Captain Tang Heng Kim, who donated the plot, was the Heng Kim of the Teochew Oral account, and also the Captain China of Singapore. I did not manage to find any verification for the existence of King Hong soon, but interestingly, in the Sangara Chenting Sangki Temple, there was an artifact donated in 1814 by someone else who was sending King. And then the British records, three partitions were sold in 1832 to Captain Swinsper by persons with sending Pan and Heng. So, very likely that the first to choose here was a partnership between uh, Heng and Han Clan. Uh, my research covered also more on the Wat Hai Chen Bureau founding, but uh, I may not have time to cover it. But you may be interested to know that the oldest Teochew temple in Samping, which is the Bangkok Chinatown, was also devoted to Shen Tian And then on the right, on your left, you see a, a, a photo I took of the two temples in Sengara. <coughs> Shintian Sangki and Masu, and on the right is a picture from one of Hoa Long's book of Wat Hai Cheng Kyo, Fort Canning in the background. And you see that they mirror each other, both with the same deities and mirroring each other. So you see the connection, the common traditions of the two Jews in Rao and Singapore. So, I'm not sure if you're convinced, but I believe we have a watertight case here that the Teochew oral account is an authentic account. Uh, this is what, but there's a one, one other question. If the Teochew knew that a group of their kinsmen were killed previously, why did they still come to Singapore, especially when, before it was so-called founded? Mm -hmm. Apparently, the Temango had an active role in this. As the British found that he had, in some instances, advanced money to the Teochew cultivators, and then in his, one of his agreements with the British, he was given assurance that he had rights over the gardens and plantations. Uh, the first description of the Teochews here as new settlers, or the Chinese here as new settlers, but allowed in January 1819, allowed to estimate that the Teochews entered here in the end 1818. Um, incidentally, on 28th November 1818, the Dutch signed a treaty with the Raja Jampa that allowed the Dutch to reoccupy Rail. And this was opposed by the Temenggong. However, the Temenggong's seal was affixed on this document, cut straight But well, what happened was, the Raja Jampa, he was only the ruler of Rail, and he could not represent the whole of Johor Empire, even though he was most powerful. 
something like that. But it, it's proud pet. The Sultan refused to be involved in any political matters. So he needed someone to rubber stamp that treaty. So I believe that he got the Temangon to do that. And as an exchange, allowed him to start gender complication in Singapore. Now very strangely, the, the diary of John Crawford, Captain John Crawford, states that the moment Raffles landed in Singapore, he requested Temangong Abdul to allow him to land his troops and raise the British flag. And the Temangong allowed this, agreed to this, even before there was any agreement. And then when they had an agreement on 30th January, the Temangong bargained for 3,000 Spanish dollars a year and also British protection. Why would he need protection? Unless he was thinking of something naughty, right? I think he was thinking of a, a rebellion to break away from the control of Real. And on the, in the formal treaty that signed with the British, he also requested for a, a part of the amount of revenue collected from native gasoles. So the question is, did the Tamangong already plan, have ideas for to set up a port or a trading center in Singapore? Especially considering the background of Tan Heng Kim, his legacy to the the, the produce traders there. Or was, was there a meeting of mind between him and Raffles when he came together in, in 1819? Yeah. Uh, sorry, it's a bit rushed, but any questions, please kindly, you can email me. Thank you. Thank you. And the last speaker of the day is Mr. Shea Kan Khan, Chinese scholar. Kan Khan is pursuing his PhD in South Asian study with a designated emphasis in such studies at the University of California, Berkeley. His research interests are ethnicity and identity politics, left wing movements, transnational network, Cold War, the later Indonesia, and the Netherlands. His topic for today is titled and strange comrades, communism, identity politics, and interwoman networks of the late colonial war in 1927, 1942. Over to you. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for coming, and thank you to my two colleagues for the wonderful presentation. In today's presentation, I will talk about an unsuccessful communist revolt that took place in the Dutch East Indies, today is Indonesia. In the late uh, 1926 and early 1927. In first I, the title might not seem so important or even relevant to Singapore, but I hope my short presentation today will give you some new insight into how communism, communism originated in this part of the world. So speaking of communist movement in British Malaya, we usually we are usually uh, we are usually very familiar with the communist resistance against the Japanese during World War II, the British anti-communist suppression during the so-called emergency period, and the guerrilla war that the MCP the MCP fought uh, that lasted until late 1980s. Senior historians like Cha Hong Kian and Yong Qingfa have published extensively on these topics. We also see a lot of memoirs written by previous uh, common members of the MCP in recent years, such as Chen Ping's My Side of History. So comparatively, there are a lot less uh, work on the origin of communism in British Malaya during the late colonial period. And if we focus on Malaysia alone, the story goes like this. First, uh, scholars have mentioned that there are early influences from the Partai Communist Indonesia, from, from Indonesia, basically uh, Indonesian communist leaders like Tamaraka, Simon, Lasono, they all passed by Singapore and route to Europe or to China and tried to establish local communist organizations, but they got very disappointed after they found out that local Malay population were not very politically active. So. Uh, in 1925, uh, the Chinese Communist Party, CCP, helped establish the Nanyang Communist Party under the tutelage of Communist International, or Comintern. And finally, in 1930, uh, 
we have the formal establishment of the Malayan Communist Party. So the problem with this part of the history is that uh, usually the pre-World War II history about MCP are scarce. The, the materials are very scarce. And also, as we all understand, uh, later MCP became a very predominantly Chinese Communist Party. So many people think uh, they got a lot of influence from China. Uh, we can discuss it discuss this later, yes or no, yeah. And also, uh, now scholars tend to rely on documents from colonial archives, uh, either the archive of uh, the colonial like administration or the archive of the, of the police. And also, uh, there are also materials discovered at the uh, Covington archives in Moscow. But uh, since it takes time uh, for a message to travel, so uh, we doubt whether people in Moscow actually know that much about the movement in Southeast Asia at that time. So, uh, what I'm gonna, gonna uh, discuss today is how to use digitized newspaper archive or newspaper SG as a method rather than just a source to study communist movement in, uh, in Southeast Asia. So, first of all, on this topic, we can use multiple sources. And also, because it's a digitized newspaper archive, so it comes with the optical character recognition or the OCR kind of function. OCR means it's basically searchable. So, uh, we have Straight Times, the Singapore Free Press, Malaya Tribune, uh, Malaya Saturday Post, and Nanyang Shangbo. It's the only OCR like Chinese newspaper. Uh, that is searchable. And of course, uh, this news coverages uh, come from different sources like Reuters that we are most familiar with and also the Dutch equivalents of Aneta. And local, also uh, there are local news, uh, Dutch East Indies newspapers. And also this newspapers actually had uh, local correspondents in Dutch East Indies. And there are also different opinion pieces uh, written by different people. And also, uh, we use digitized newspaper archives. So it means we can cover these two parts uh, pretty well. Unlike traditional newspapers, we can track the progression of events. So we can see how events develop, develop. And also, uh, on the other hand, it's basically the snapshot of historical moment. As you can see, in, uh, in one page, when you see communist movement, at the same time you see the development of uh, communication technology. People at the time can talk directly from Batavia to people in the Hague. Or you can see at the news uh, about shipping companies. So they all construct a very important historical context, uh, context that we can and that we can use to study uh, communism. And also, there's a very interesting tool uh, at. Uh, newspaper SG, uh, it's called search term visualizer. Uh, that's why I think uh, counting does count. So this is the first chart, uh, first graphic I want to show. In this graphic, you can see how the media discussion of comments or communism changed over time in Singapore before World War II broke out. As you can see, there is indeed a increase after the establishment of the MCP in 1930. But there is also a big surge since 1925 onward. It is about, it is it about uh, uh, Chinese uh, Communist Party's branch, uh, Nanyang Communist Party? Uh, the answer is no. Because at the time, Nanyang Communist Party is very negligible. And actually, the discussion about communism and communism is about communist movement elsewhere. Uh, so this is the second graphic I want to show. If we put keywords Java and communist, then we get a pretty clear idea. As you can see, 1925, 26, and 27 are the peak years. I use the word Java instead of the formal the term Dutch East Indies because this is what the most newspapers do in their reports. 
Is it possible that media in Singapore suddenly became interested in Java and communism as, as two separate things? In other words, are people really interested in communism in Java during the period of uh, 1925 to 27? We can see in this graphic that uh, the interest in Java uh, is quite stable. Yeah, it, there's no like a sudden increase in 25 or 26. So the interest in communism in Java is true. And we can go even one step further by comparing communist Java and communist China. Uh, as you can see, uh, Chinese communists exerted far more influence on British Maya than their Indonesian counterpart. This is true. But there's an exception which happened in 1926. This made me wonder what really happened in the Dutch East Indies and what were its repercussions on British Malaya. So, of course, as you can probably imagine, the last graphic is actually very problematic, and it has to do with the intrinsic shortcomings of digitized newspapers. We should recognize that there are uh, technical problems with OCR, so sometimes they cannot recognize characters very clearly, and also there are a lot of noises in data uh, for example, it can be China in story A and uh, communism in story B, but somehow the two stories are in one article, so uh, then uh, the, the same article pop up in, this, in the search. Therefore, the digital archive is useful in giving us a general trend, idea about the trend, but we also need to investigate the content really intensively. So here I'm listing three major events that might affect our understanding of Kham's movement in Malaya before World War II. The first uh, is what I, I'll discuss today. It's the Kham's re revolt in Java and Sumatra that happened in 26, 27. And also in 27, there's another very important event that took place in China. And that is the disintegration of the first Kuomintang and Chinese Kham's party united from. So after that, uh, event, a lot of Chinese communists fled to British Malaya. And also, uh, as you can see, and recently that's the commemoration of uh, World War II, uh, the fall of Singapore. Uh, so, uh, World War II broke out in China uh, in 1937, uh, and also uh, it happened uh, five years later in British Malaya. Uh, and a lot of things happened during these five years, but that's well be something I will discover later in my project. So the pretext. Uh, one year before the revolt, communism already caused a lot of unrest in Dutch East Indies. Uh, all the disturbances were problematically as communist movement. There are labor disputes, there are bomb threats or firecrackers threat if you would like to call it and the Chinese nationalist movement, they're also pan-Islamic movement. They're all, they are all labeled as communist movement. And also, it's probably the way how we label like terrorist attack today. Everything is a terrorist attack. And also, uh, at the same time, uh, the Dutch colonial government was on, uh, put a lot of stringent anti-communist measures. Uh, so first, uh, there are very strict media regulations. They constantly uh, just punish the newspapers uh, for publishing anti-Dutch articles. And also there are endless arrests, trials, and banishment of communists or uh, anyone who writes against the Dutch. And also, of course, uh, they, are, they uh, suppress uh, strikes, punish communist synthesizers within their uh, like within the, the colonial government or in the colonial army, and also there's a very uh, strict ban on all kind of public meetings. Uh, apparently, the, there are also controversies. For example, uh, there was a bomb controversy in Jakarta. Uh, so in this controversy, uh, basically the police officer uh, supplied dynamite to communists and uh, ask the police spy to provoke them to throw the bomb uh, to military facility. 
And so there are a lot of discussion about whether uh, this kind of uh, strategy is actually ethical because you are actually promoting criminal act. And second, there was a, a suicide case uh, of Thomas Sugono in the prison. So that raised the concern of whether the comments are mistreated in Dutch prison. And also, uh, this Haji Mispa is very uh, famous during that time. Uh, he's called a red Haji, so basically uh, he's Muslim, but at the same time he used the doctrine of communism to promote religious doctrines and vice versa. And somehow uh, he died in, uh, concept, uh, in his banishment in New Guinea. And people started to ask whether the government is wise to make him a martyr. So apparently, the Dutch colonial government, government was under a lot of pressure. So in return, they also put even more pressures on the communists. So how events unfolded. Uh, so what really happened, I can literally summarize it in just one minute. Basically, it's two very unsuccessful communist uprisings in Java and Sumatra. Just like any other anarchist unrest you've heard, the participants of this revolt are not necessarily true communists, but peasants or urban thugs. <coughs> the damage was quite limited. A few native police officers got killed, or one European officer got killed. The Dutch authorities quickly suppressed the whole movement within just a few days. The biggest achievement, or in other words, uh, the biggest trouble that the revolt caused uh, to the Dutch authorities was paralyzing the communication by cutting wires, occupying telephone offices, and kidnapping operators, which created a lot of uh, anxiety and fear. Uh, fear. And we see all this uh, happening in the news. And so the news coverage is very quick. And within a few days, you get the latest message from Dutch Indies in, uh, in Singapore. It's very detailed, and also it comes from multiple sources, so very reliable in the sense that uh, they you can cross-check them. But it's also very unreliable because there are a lot of rumors. They are being repetitive. So if one person gets killed, and then if, if the news being re repetitive, it means that you heard like maybe three people get killed. And also uh, a lot of things got exaggerated. And of course, uh, there are discussions about the arrests, the trials, and banishment. Interestingly, this all applied uh, uh, to the British strategy uh, to counter the uh, communist movement later in British Malaya. So there are arrests of uh, communists and communist synthesizers. There are trials uh, and also a banishment of communists to the remote area. So in British Malaya, it's the banishment of foreign-born communists, uh, mostly Chinese, back to China. So um, more interestingly, uh, uh, there are discussions about whether the neighbor's trouble is also our trouble in British Malaya. Uh, in the aftermath of uh, the communist revolt, there are many interesting discussions in Singapore. The first being uh, uh, like uh, whether the, the revolt was plotted in Singapore. Because uh, at the time, uh, some leaders such as Ma and Tan Malaka were indeed in Singapore, uh, which uh, has been proved false later. Uh, it was just rumor. And then uh, after the revolt, many uh, like Indonesian communist uh, fugitives escaped to British Malaya. And there was a rumor at the beginning, but it turned out to be true. Uh, and also there are opinion pieces uh, from uh, different observers. Sir Percival Phillips is a very renowned uh, journalist. He went to Dutch East Indies uh, after the revolt. And he talked to colonial officials. Uh, and according to his observation, uh, the direct attempt had already failed. But the indirect ways 
of the communist movement still exists. So it's a bit like, and also uh, he also summarized or concluded that uh, there are identical interests among the British and the Dutch, and they face the same problems and they face the same danger. Therefore, they should cooperate to fight against communism. Another observer, Hubert Banner, uh, who was in Dutch East Indies at the time of revolt, read a novel called Red Cobra. And according to him, the actual revolt uh, was a lot worse than reported. So there are many bad consequences. Uh, and then the British uh, started to introduce uh, like more stringent measures against communism. Uh, it's very common that strikes in Singapore would be suppressed, and there are a lot of raids on communist activities, uh, on nice schools of the Hainanese, and also there's censorship. Just uh, one example uh, appeared in the newspaper. Uh, British movie The Only Way, which is about the French, uh, French Revolution, was censored because and uh, government think it has different implications in that uh, political context. And also, uh, the Dutch and the British started to uh, work with each other. And also in 1927, two communist leaders, Alimi and Musso, got arrested in Johor and uh, later transferred to Singapore, but they were soon released because uh, the British thought uh, they didn't pose direct threat to the public security. Uh, of British Maya. And shortly after, the Legislative Council in Britain discussed this issue and decided to amend the law. Uh, then in, 1970, uh, in 1931, by closely coordinating with the Dutch and French authorities in the Dutch East Indies, French Indochina, and British gov the British government in Singapore arrested Comintern agent Joseph Dukrom, who was sent by the Comintern to expand communist organizations in Malaya. His arrest led to another more, uh, more important arrest of Hilaire Newland, a top communist official in Shanghai. Also in uh, 1932, the British police in Hong Kong arrested the probably most famous Indonesian communist, uh, Tan Malaka. Besides discussions on politics, we can also see many discussions on technology related uh, to the revolt. Apparently, technology is a double-edged sword that is both loved and hated by different groups. So first, uh, people discussed about the security of motor lorries for the transport of troops. And troops can be transferred very quickly by using the vehicles, and it's also more reliable than uh, railways. If railway got cut up, and then the troops ju just cannot uh, go in. And also, uh, from the company side, there are new ways to do their propaganda. And, and there was a case in which radio broadcast in easily understood, uh, understandable Malay language was picked up by a Chinese listener. And also there are uh, gramophone records found uh, in, uh, in Dutch East India, which caused a lot of uh, anxiety. And also, uh, as you can see, uh, in the Legislative Council of the Street Test Settlement, there was a discussion about whether or not Malaya should take a step ahead to build a wireless communication network for anti communist purposes. So uh, basically, uh, people are arguing that wireless uh, communication was paralyzed in Dutch East Indies, thus, thus the government couldn't react very effectively. And also, the telephone office got occupied so uh, it's very hard to call uh, like uh, reinforcement. So and that legislative council member suggests that uh, that the colonial government in British Maya should build wireless telegraphic or telephonic system for the police and the military. Just like English newspapers, the articles of Nanyang Shangbo. Uh, newspaper ar ar archives in non-English languages are, of course, very different animals. 
Many language newspapers, uh, language newspapers such as Wartel Malaya and Utusan Malayi did not appear until 1930s, and they are written in Java uh, script. The OCR accuracy of Chinese is uh, a, lot a lot lower. The quality is lower, and the accuracy is lo lower. And Nanyang Shangba is so far the only one that has been digitized, but still, we can find many interesting things from it. Uh, so I just put Gong Chan, Gong Chan Dang, or Gong Chan Zhu uh, Yi, uh, plus Zhao Wa, Zhao Wa. Um, just like English newspapers, the articles of Nanyang Shangba are based on multiple sources. More interestingly, uh, they also had close contact with Chinese newspapers in Dutch East Indies, which provided us with an extra angle to study this particular subject. So, besides carving the similar stories uh, as the English newspapers, Nanyang Shangbao was also very committed to defend the uh, Indian Chinese community. So, the Dutch newspapers like Java Boat and Surabaya's Handelsblad uh, accused the Chinese for promoting native communists to rise against the Dutch. And they also asked the question, why did communists not rise against Chinese in Bantan? Uh, and also, uh, so to react, the Chinese newspapers in Dutch East Indies uh, start to reason that uh, communist revolt coincided with Chinese activities in commemoration of Dr. Sun Yat-sen, who was regarded as a communist by some uh, Western uh, observers, but apparently he's the uh, head of Chinese nationalist movement. Uh, so Nanyang Shangbao basically uh, just reiterated the same point uh, up here in the Chinese newspapers in Dutch East Indies. So, conclusion. First, I would say Singapore media's coverage on the Dutch East Indies Communist Revolt was very detailed, it's very comprehensive and up-to-date. And precisely because of this, the anxiety for communism was contagious and real. And British anti-communist measures predated the actual formal establishment of the NCP. Uh, the NCP wasn't established until 1930s, but before 1930s, there were already very sorrow anti-communist measures uh, by the British. And also, uh, we should also pay attention to the historical uh, hindsight, uh, or what we call hindsight bias. Just because later the membership of the Malayan Communist Party was predominantly Chinese, does not mean that communism in British Malaya was necessarily a China import. The PKI, and what happened in and after 1926 and 27 in the Dutch East Indies definitely played very complex roles in shaping the early communist movement and how anti-communist policies were carried out in Malaya. And this research is far from complete. In my larger dissertation project, I will try to deal with this major contradiction, namely, Communism as an egalitarian ideology, but at the same time, uh, communist movement are racially segregated. And I like to ask the question, why did two trends of communist movement fail to converge in Malaya? Namely, the communist movement from China and the communist movement from Dutch East Indies. And because of the wholesale suppression against communism, the 1930s in the Dutch Indies is regarded as a period of uh, rules and order, or peace and order. I wonder if this is true. Uh, and how did anti-colonial uh, movement take shape in other forms, such as the colonial nationalist uh, approach? And in Malaya, in Malaya too, influenced by PKI fugitives, such as Sultan Jinai, Malay left to form the uh, Kasatuan Malay Muda, which adopted a pro-Japanese approach during, during the war, whereas the NCP, influenced by and actively participated in the Chinese National Salvation Movement, became the backbone of anti-Japanese forces, uh, anti forces after the fall of Singapore. 
Uh, finally, it's equally interesting to me what the Dutch sources have to say about these topics, and probably more. And this is my presentation today, and thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Alright, now we open the floor to questions. If you have any comments or questions, please raise your hand, introduce yourself. So that, okay, do you have one? Yeah. No, okay. Anybody has questions for speakers? No? How about our speakers? Do you have any questions for all? <laughs> all right, okay. Um, I think everyone enjoyed the talk today, right? Okay, great. Uh, on that very good note, I'd like to thank all the three speakers, uh, Sandra Hart, Jason, and Sheikh Khan Khan for presenting to the public on your findings. So thank you for your participation and um, we have come to the end of this session and uh, we hope you have enjoyed this uh, sharing session um, and the next fellowship presentation will be scheduled in late March. So please look out for our posters for the All right, thank you very much all.